Uh, welcome to all of you for what is going to be a terrific 90 minutes or so. We are Brookings, and we do books. And sometimes our trustees write books. Uh, and we're going to have a conversation today, obviously, with the trustee and, and the author in question. But I just want to give you, very much in a personal vein, a little bit about Dick Blum uh, as a friend of mine and a friend of this institution. We had crossed paths a couple of times, maybe more than a couple of times, in the 80s and the 90s. But when we really got together was very shortly after I came to Brookings, which was 15 years ago. We became genuine friends. We spent time uh, talking, and we spent time getting exercise. Uh, Dick was a runner, uh, still is a runner, I would guess. I'm wearing my, I'm, I'm wearing my Nikes. But I blew out my knee uh, long ago, and we had a number of occasions when he took me running on the towpath canal with me following him on my bicycle. And that's the kind of guy uh, he is. We also discovered very early on in our relationship that we had some overlapping aspirations and dreams. I will never forget, not too long after I got here, that he picked me up in his SUV and we uh, drove to his uh, house in Northwest, and he opened up to me on uh, his lifelong desire to help beat global poverty in general, and specifically to help the little guy in the village. I think anybody in this room who knows Dick has heard that phrase from him many, many times. Out of that bond, he became a trustee of the institution and a founder of our global economy and development program that Kamal Dervish so ably leads. He also uh, made possible the Brookings Blum Roundtable on Poverty in Aspen, Colorado. Uh, it's just uh, this last August hit the, no the lucky number 13. There have been 13 roundtables. This has become the annual conference for thought leadership and for catalyzing action and progress on this very important and uh, uh, international and national commitment that we all have to have uh, in dealing with po poverty. The success of the Brown Table has been very much because Dick has brought uh, a number of people from around the world, a number from the West Coast, and also working very harmoniously and productively uh, with Kamal. Let me say just a couple of words about the book. It's a terrific book. I've said that to him. I've uh, written it. Uh, as you know, the title of the book is An Accident of Geography. I have two small quibbles with that. First of all, the word, the word accent. Uh, accident. Uh, this uh, career that uh, he has a perspective on in the book is not born of accident. It's born of character, idealism, aspiration, and a passion for really getting things done. And as for geography, yes, that's very much part of the story. But so is topography, since there are quite a few mountains involved in the geography that he writes about in the, uh, in the book, including the highest mountain uh, on the planet. But the subtitle has it right exactly. Compassion, innovation, and the fight against poverty. We're very glad that 
Tom Hayes is here, who worked with Dick on the book. Also, his daughter, Annette, from Los Angeles and lots of other places, it sounds like. Uh, and we have with us Rod Shaw, who was the administrator of AID. What was go we're going to do now is Dick is going to give us some perspective on the theme of the book and the theme of his adventurous, activist, enterprising, athletic, and philanthropic life. Then he's going to have a conversation with Homi Karras, the deputy director of our global pro program, and a Q&A with all of you. We will also, of course, have a book signing uh, after the formal program is finished. Dick, thank you for being here. Thank you for being such a pal. And thanks for making our world better at all altitudes. Well, I don't know what started me coughing five minutes ago. It was not Strobe's introduction. Um, but as long as you brought up the title of the book, let's start with that. Um, what I meant by accident of geography, <clears throat> a lot of us were born in a, at a time and a place where we could get the education, the training, the opportunity to learn how to run things. And for some of us, we're lucky enough to wind up with more capital than we need and that we owe it to the rest of the world. And that's where I come from. Um, I was taped by uh, Chris Matthews last night. Um, it'll be on tonight. And he, he asked me the question, which was the softball question <clears throat> been asked in my life. He said, um, Donald Trump thinks if you have money, you should flaunt it and spend it on yourself. You have a different view of what you ought to do if you have extra money. So you can only imagine what the answer to that was. So I assume that I'll be hearing from the Trump lawyer soon. Uh, <laughs> and he's just saying I'm not a fan. Um, so the way this was all started was kind of by accident. I had always wanted to go to the Himalayas. I'd had this fascination since I was seven, eight years old. So I went there in 1981. I had a well, no, I led an Everest expedition in 81. I went originally to Nepal in 68. And I went there. I was going to Bangkok on business, and I just kept going. And the first night out, uh, a couple of us spent in a Tibetan refugee camp. And there was these little kids that were either born there or carried over the mountains, friendly, you know. I mean, you, you fell in love in about 10 minutes. And then for the next month. Uh, this is when you, you know, we never saw another foreigner for a month. And it was a strange land. Now going there after 49 years, it's like going home. Trails were a little narrower. I didn't know really where we were going. But the people look after you in, in not the subservient way. I think it's a Buddhist nature. They looked after you as they would say uh, a, a fellow sentient being. And so we started um, kind of informally, this is back in the 70s, helping, as many trekkers do, the kids of Sherpas that we went with. And at some point, I see all this kind of build up over a period of time, I um, uh, said, well, this isn't really fair. We're just helping Sherpa kids of Sherpas we know. What about the other ones that may be just as worthwhile or uh, are, are deserving? So I met a, a long, tall fellow by the name of Sir Edmund Hillary, and we became close friends for about 30 years till he passed away. And most of the Himalayan Trust work um, in Nepal, which he started, we have funded for most of that time. And uh, we said, we, we don't know who to help, not, who not to help. Why don't we have a venture? We'll give you the money. You decide. Now, the thing about Ed Hillary 
in the annals of people who are good in the development world, you wouldn't see his name listed there, except on my list. This is a guy who went to the villages, helped build schools, pounded nails. I never pounded nails with him because I'm not capable. But um, in any event, so over this period of time, we've known families forever. I'm a godfather to one family for over 40 years. So part of the, that is I think about them all the time, as you would relatives. I understand a lot of their problems. I understand a lot of what they, they're doing. But um, I'm also convinced that you can find kids in the villages or out in the fields that are just smart as any of us. In fact, his name was Pasankami, who was the Sherpa I first met, uh, the family I'm the godfather to. When I first met him, he was an assistant cook to the Indian Army the year before, making $18 a month. Uh, his grandson just graduated from USF, a degree in accounting, and has gone to work for Deloitte Touche at a starting salary of $60,000, and he'll go up from there. And increasingly, we also see when you bring kids from the developing world, certainly where we're used to, <clears throat> despite some other attitudes towards immigration, they understand better than we do what the opportunities that they have, and they work very hard, and the success rate, I think, is quite high. So over the years, the American Himalayan Foundation grew basically because six of us scruffy guys came off of Mount Everest in 1981, the Tibetan side, and we were the first ones ever allowed to go there, and said, let's do something. So the American Himalayan Foundation today has probably touches maybe close to 400,000 lives. It's, of course, started with the Sherpas and, and the Tibetan refugees and the Dalai Lama. But our biggest prog program is something we weren't even aware of in early years, and that is trafficking. And we have 15,000 young girls in school being saved from being sold. And however bad you think the trafficking problem is, it's worse than that. And a lot of these young women uh, develop AIDS, 80% um, of them do. They never live to be 20 years. And so I don't know how the rest of you feel. I probably, so when I see somebody like Trump making those comments towards young women, you wonder what kind of impression does he make on young men who then may want to run after um, some house of prostitution and so forth. Anyhow, I feel this very deeply, and, and uh, as you can tell. Uh, so, um, but what I also learned is that if all you do is talk to government officials, you may get good advice, you may not get good advice, but I guarantee you one thing, most of the money won't go where you think it's supposed to go. So um, uh, some years ago, King Barendra, who unfortunately, when they had this assassination, most of the royal family was killed, said, Richard, whenever possible, avoid doing business with my government, which, I mean, I can't find anybody in Nepal who knew him well believes that he said that to me, but he in fact did. And if you think about it, if you go to the villages, most of the ideas of the projects we, we do today didn't come from us. We listen to what they want, so we hear all kinds of ideas. You know, some of them good, some of them not so good. So our batting average of success is pretty high, mainly because we're responding to, to, to their needs. And, and um, if you think about it, it, it's pretty hard to be dishonest in a village because you're going to get caught and then you're going to have to leave the village. If you're some government official, and I, I think we would all who uh, study this stuff, or so many of you who have lived abroad, will find probably the biggest problem of injustice in the world is, is corruption. And... Um, and with some of them, it, it doesn't seem to matter how much money they get, they never get enough. I've spent a lot of time being on with Jimmy Carter, been on his board for the last 15 years. Um, 
What I would say about Jimmy Carter, and I, I have been in all the worst possible places in Africa with him. He never goes to any place that's any good. So if, it, in any, if, you, if you've ever been to South Sudan or have the opportunity to go there, turn it down. Um, <laughs> but really, I mean, he's going there to solve problems. And you ask people who've been around for a long time, they talk about Jimmy Carter like he was a saint. It's almost the same way uh, the Nepalese, the Sherpas talk about Sir Edmund Hillary. So one of the things my concern is, um, if we're going to be a success at that, you know, how many followers do we have after Jimmy Carter? First of all, I've been involved with the Clinton Foundation, and despite all that you hear, they do an awful lot of good work. Uh, Raj knows this. He worked with them, uh, particularly on AIDS projects. And um, and then, I mean, nobody spends more money there than Bill Gates. So we just need to do more and more of that. But if you think about it, um, people understand a, a lot of these countries. When we want, when we decided to do whatever we decided to do in Afghanistan and in um, Iraq, they were searching around to find people who spoke Arabic. Now, if we had been going there and had friends in places like this for 100 years, we might have done things differently. We probably could have done things better. It's almost impossible to think that we couldn't have done things better, or maybe the best thing would have been not to go there at all, but that's a, that's a different story. So to me, it all started with, way back, Jack Kennedy and the Peace Corps. Now, the Peace Corps today, is has a budgeted, I think, of, what a half a billion, a half of five hundred million dollars. It's nothing, and whether it's the Peace Corps or, you know, private sector, I wouldn't call what we do Peace Corps, but people that do this thing. If if we're going to have peace in this world, we need to have understanding, and we need to help bring people out of poverty. A lot of people have come out of poverty in the last decade, an enormous number. By the way, the biggest amount of people that have come out of poverty has been China. Um, so democracy is not always the answer. In fact, um, Luis Alberto Moreno, who some of you may know, who's the head of the Inter-American Development Bank, says the more inequality you have, the harder it is to run a democracy. And you sort of think of what's been going on in the election cycle the last year and you wonder to what extent is the issue of inequality responsible for a lot of the uh, chaos. And um, when you, we have a new administration, I don't think that, you know, hopefully Hillary can ignore what has been said by both Sanders and to a certain extent by Trump about what we have to do to make sure that there is more equal opportunity for everybody here. So um, I could go on and talk about that. I'll give you two minutes on, the, on what the, the biggest thing we do now is our center at Berkeley. It's the Blum Center for Developing Economies. And why I think all this works is the enthusiasm the kids have had at Berkeley and now at all 10 UC campuses. For, for global development is off the charts. Um, it, we made it a minor. We didn't make it a major. It's because if you said to me, you can major in business or you can major in global poverty, I would have said, I want to major in business. But if you said you can major in business and minor in global poverty, I said, okay. So we actually have kids from 51 different majors at Berkeley. I didn't know there was that many minoring in global poverty, and in the 160-year history of the university, there's never had that kind of interest. To get your minor degree, you take certain courses, and you have to go spend three or four months in an approved project overseas. Our students have, we've now had 15,000 of them through our classes, and we've been to 80 different countries. So not only can you, you know, model the Peace Corps idea, there's plenty of young people who want to do this with their lives. And in fact, about oh, six, eight months ago, a woman came up to me and she said, you don't know who I am, 
but I run the Peace Corps office in Berkeley, and um, your students are overrunning the place. So th there is an opportunity to improve our relations and our understanding and our, our work work abroad. And um, so I just, to the extent that you believe in what I've said and you want to influence whatever academic institution or equivalent uh, uh, company or corporation or what have you, uh, please do it because it's not hard to believe in this stuff. So I don't know. Um, we're very happy with what we see at Berkeley. We're trying to work with other campuses. Matter of fact, another number of thanks to um, Raj when he was at AID. AID saw what we were doing. Our main major partner, not surprisingly, a lot of people thought my major partner would be the business school. No, it's the School of Engineering because most people are brought out of poverty because of innovation. And AID funded a lot of our innovation work with our center, with the School of Engineering, and it's continuing. And the latest thing is, it, you would have thought there was a Marine Corps invasion of the campus at Berkeley, which if you know what Berkeley's like, you'd say, oh, whoa, how does that happen? But a lot of the retired or about the retired one-star generals who have spent time in places like Iraq and Afghanistan want to continue to, to go on, and they're interested in our work. And what could be better than people who have spent time and have learned about these countries to send them back? So that's the latest uh, thing that has come up in the last month. Next month will be something else, but it grows. So thank you. Dick, so thank you, uh, uh, thank you so much. It's a uh, real honor to be uh, uh, up here and a uh, real pleasure to be talking about this uh, book because the book is really a, uh, uh, it's a great, uh, uh, it's a great book. Uh, One thing, could I ask Tom Hayes to stand? Because the guy who really wrote the book is, 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 is Tom. <laughs> Take a bow, Tom. Thank you, Dick. So, you know, I, I wanted to uh, uh, start by uh, asking you about some of the, uh, one of the, one of the things that's great about this book is that there are all these nuggets in there, and they're almost just sort of, you know, thrown in quite casually, but they're actually very deep. And one of them was, yeah, right at the end, you had a comment about what really drives you is empathy, altruism, and the ability to get things done. And I was sitting there thinking, if you had to uh, talk about what usually drives people who are really successful at business, those wouldn't be the first things that would uh, come, to, uh, uh, come to my mind. And when you think about people who have those kinds of values, you know, sometimes it's uh, driven by a particular event in their uh, life or uh, something like that. That doesn't seem to have been the case with you. It just seems to have been something that you've acquired naturally and built up over time. It's just always been part of you. So can you tell us a little I, I, bit I about know. that? It may have been that first couple of weeks to been a refugee camp and out trekking with uh, local people that said, my goodness, these are lovely people. We should help them. Maybe there's something to do here. And if you think about it, one thing sort of led to another. And in other words, I, I was probably the first decade, because we're up in the mountains, most of the hill people, the lower caste Hindus, are the ones where the girls get sold. I, I wasn't even aware of the project. Um, and uh, so a lot of it is kind of by happenstance. Um, I just... Um, uh, I mean, to give you an idea, uh, I had never been in Alabama until a month ago, and, and I had to look it up and find out where Alabama was, but um, in any event, 
I, when I go to the Carter Center, there is a African-American driver by the name of Moses. So if you got a guy by the name of Moses, you better follow what he says. And he, he, he would show me about around Atlanta because it's an interesting city. And I said, um, Moses, are you from Atlanta? He says, no, I'm from Alabama. I said, well, why did you move to Atlanta? He says, you know what Alabama's like? <laughs> no, I've never been there. So we started talking, and he said, there is just um, the village he came from, which is 15 miles from uh, Monroeville, which is, if you know where Monroeville is, this is to kill a mockingbird where it took place. He said, we just want to build a modest center for African-American uh, older people. They have no place to go, and nobody around here will help us. So I had no idea whether I wanted to do it or not. So a couple of us flew in there and decided to fund the project. And so and it's, they said, well, why'd you do that? I said, because somebody needs to do this thing. And, you know, I mean, at least for me, and I think for most of us, you go do something like that and you change the lives and for a bunch of older people, give them a place to hang out, you feel good about it. At least I do, anyway. But you've never stopped with just feeling But, but what I'm saying is a lot of what I do is because I just trip over things, you know. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that comes through in your title of the accident, but somehow I suspect that there's something Not a little bit kind of accident, uh, beyond uh, that. I mean, you know, there are lots of people who, you know, do something, they feel good about it, but you're not satisfied with that. You think big about doing well, more Well, some of my associates want and, uh, big townhouses in, in, in New York that never appeal to me. I'm happy to pay the hotel bill and spend the money, obviously, where we're spending it. I, I, and by the way, I think to a certain extent, um, Wall Street gets a bad rap. Uh, there are a lot of people there that are a are not dishonest, uh, and b who uh, are generous. Um, they tend not to do the kinds of things we do, and you know, it may just be the the local hospital or something in 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 Harlem or what have you. I think there's and and what we see particularly out our way in San Francisco, which is, I've lived there all my life and I've never seen wealth created or a boom like we have there now. So you pe see people like, you know, from uh, Facebook, Zuckerberg, or, or uh, Salesforce, um, uh, Mark Medioff, uh people who have made a lot of money in a hurry are also taking a lot of their money in a hurry and trying to do good things with it. So I think increasingly, there is an understanding among successful people that they need to put their dividend back. And so hopefully it will continue. Are there the old school guys that say, I made it, I want to keep it? Of course. Yeah, there's obviously been a uh, huge tradition of uh, philanthropy in uh, America. And uh, I think that uh, you, know, you are uh, part of that uh, great tradition. But one of the things that has uh, distinguished, I think, uh, what you've done is that uh, you've thought about how to spend the money to have a really big impact. And uh, I, I was looking at some of the things that you talk about in the uh, book. So, you talked about ownership uh, very uh, uh, very early on, and uh, I would say that was probably 30 years before USAID started to uh, really take uh, ownership uh, very seriously. Uh, you know, you talk about uh, the importance of culture, and uh, a lot of your uh, uh, work is uh, devoted to uh, culture and uh, improving the place where people live to give them some pride in that place, and then, of course, moving into uh, trafficking. These aren't what I would call the traditional realms of what people were thinking about at that time, certainly, when they thought about how do I try to do development and improve the lives of people. So Certainly not restoring old temples way right. up in the mountains like we do in Mustang would automatically occur to us. In fact, we'd never done anything like that. But we were the first foreigners to go to this 
for those of you, and I assume that most don't know where Mustang is, it is a Tibetan enclave still in Nepal that's been run down by time, not been destroyed. And um, a couple of us were the first foreigners allowed to go there. And um, the place was pretty close to being dead. And the Raja or the king of Mustang said, look, if you want to bring it back to life, you have to start by restoring a couple of these temples, which have turned out to be gorgeous, and our monastic school. And the monastic school is more than just teaching monks how to be good monks. Um, they're active at running small businesses and helping in the community. So we did what he told us to because he said, that's how you bring this place back to life. And we've been doing it for 20 years and, you know, and it's working. So, I mean, I would never have thought of doing that. Uh, and I wasn't sure we were doing the right thing when we started, but I listened to the old man and he made sense and it's been, been successful. But um, uh, unless you get into these places, and understand what their problems are, you don't get there. So, I mean, you gotta, I mean, for 30 years, we, you know, spent most of our time in tents. Now, if I can stay in some little um, lodge with a shower over the tent, I'll do it any time. You know, I'm 81 years old, I think I'm entitled. And <laughs> I go looking for the lodges, but, um, and, and I wonder now that you see some, but some people like have gotten smart, particularly in places like Bhutan, of saying, well, why would I go to Bhutan? That's roughing it. Well, you can go to Bhutan. It's not roughing it. It's got eight almond lodges. It's got all this stuff. So you see, you have wealthier people starting to go to remote, interesting places. And it'll be interesting to see whether they're there long enough whether they learn enough, whether there's enough of an impact that maybe in in so many remote parts of the world where we don't do much, whether that starts to change. I think it needs to. So you said that one of the things that uh, you know led you down this path was that you just listened to the old man, but you know, lots of people could have chosen to listen to people. There must be people telling you you know, you should do this and you should do that all the time. So the big question is, how do you make these choices about who to listen to? How do you decide to listen to somebody? And how do you decide that they actually know better than you about what should be done? Here you are, you're a very wow. successful person. You know all these kinds of things. Well, it, we really started, it had nothing to do with all this. It started, we were the first private equity guys in Asia and, you know, in the U.S., so when you look at projects, somebody comes to you and wants you to help fund their company, then you go in and um, you know kick the tires and see if it makes sense. And in that world, you, you, you turn down way more than you ever fund. So it's kind of a skill set of knowing how to listen to people, when do they make sense and when don't they. And, and then if you find something, for instance, in our investment business, we, I mean, if we get in and out of something in three years, that's a trade. We tend to find businesses and grow with them, just as we have done with American Himalayan Foundation. We started with Sherpas and wound up with, you know, trafficking issues. Um, so, um, and, and particularly with our investing in, in Korea and China and so forth, I mean, my best partner for 20 years now spent most of his um, teenage years building mud bricks in the Gobi Desert, and he's as smart as they come. And I've not gotten to the point where I don't go kicking tires out in the middle of China anymore. I don't do that. And uh, so his name's Wei Jin Shan. Raj knows him. Um, and I, I just give him a certain amount of money and say, uh, good luck, and do I want to be, review the projects? No, I don't even know what half of them are, and don't care. I just have, it's, it, you, you wind up having confidence in a, you know, a group of friends proven over a period of time that are successful. Well, he's not always successful, but his batting average is pretty good, 
I would say it's the same thing in the non-for-profit thing. There are people you know that have either had a successful track record because of things they've done with you or because you know them by reputation. You've been working in uh, places where, uh, as you said, there's lots of corruption, rule of law isn't uh, really good, but you've been actually very successful in China, you've been uh, very successful in uh, other places, etc. All of that means taking a certain amount of calculated risk. Yes. So... Not always successful either. Well, on, 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 on average, it seems to have been pretty successful for you. Yes. <laughs> Just luck? Just an accident? No. It's the skill set that you develop. Uh, particularly, if you're going to invest in China, you're gonna, not going to learn it in a textbook. You've got to go out there. And uh, There was a book written a number of years ago called Mr. China, and it's about a young investment banker that went to China and highly gullible and all the you know, things he got tricked into. Um, it's still out there, but um, having said that, um, uh, somebody said, what's the, how, how are you successful in China? It's like any place else. Know who your partners are, build the friendships. Uh, there's a lot of corruption there, but there's also a lot of very smart, good people too. The way in which you uh, sort of approach risk in the uh, business world, uh, is that the same, different from the way in which you approach risk when doing a mountaineering expedition, when uh, taking on a new philanthropic uh, uh, initiative? They seem to be pretty different types yeah. of uh, risk. The risk-reward relationship on climbing Everest from the most difficult route is a different mm -hmm. risk-reward relationship. Um, I led this first expedition um, of a climbing team to go into Tibet since Mao had taken over. Um, this was a year after Diane and I were married. We didn't get to the summit, and the Chinese said, well, why don't you come back in 83? As I like to say, my wife got a PhD in mountaineering tragedies between 81 and 83, and she says, you're not going back there. That's a different kind of risk-reward thing. Um, so I didn't go back. At any rate, and I'm still here. Uh, but um, We're glad about that. Uh, I, I would say most of the development stuff, you know, you try to get something going in a group of villages or what have you, you don't really lose a lot of money. You can lose a lot of time, and you can spin your wheels, and things don't always make sense. Uh, our investment business grew to the point that a lot, of, a lot of the checks we wrote were pretty large, and a lot of it is our own capital plus institutional capital. So you, you got to be very careful, exceedingly careful that you don't make a mistake. And philanthropy, I mean, you don't see the, uh, necessarily see the immediacy of the rewards so quickly, but the uh, risks are pretty evident. I mean, you're writing the checks and the money could disappear. You give money to Brookings, and I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a pretty short I, I bet. Just, I yeah. just assume that I agree. It, it all goes well. Yeah, but not much of your philanthropy <laughs> really comes to Brookings, you know. It's sort of going <laughs> to these other places, a bit more risky. No, you, you get a sense of an organization. I, I, I'm kidding. I'm very, one of the best things I've done was uh, 15 years ago, I thought it was 10 strobes, that it's 15 years that um, he and I, I think, agreed to start our cooperation the very day he came to work here. Is that right, Strobe? And um, I've never regretted it for five minutes. And uh, I, I've also seen how Brookings has grown. Um, I mean, Brookings was always a pretty good place. Its reputation is a second to none now. And by the way, there's a book written by another one of the trustees. It's called uh, Shoe Dog. Uh, written by the founder of Nike, and um, my book's pretty good. His is humorous and better, so please read it. You work on that one too, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, 
you know, when uh, I'm no uh, mountaineer, but I would assume that when you do a mountaineering expedition, you've got people who have very specific roles. Everybody knows exactly what they uh, should be doing. When you do, uh, you know, when you're it's in not business, that organized, and it's and the higher you get, uh, the less people really remember what it was they were supposed to do even an hour before. It, um, memories get short, and people get cranky. So you need people that or have been there before, and so um, fortunately we, we had those, but it, um, it's, but, it's, it's a whole different other world. Right. But you've got specialists in what they do, and the thing that really intrigues me is that when you came into the development area, you, did, you decided to mix everything up. I mean, you've mixed engineers with social scientists, you've got uh, you know people who work in government, people who work in business. It's a whole to try to get success in development, you've actually sort of said, let's not have specialists and people just from one discipline. Let's have nice. all these people coming together and see what kinds of ideas they can throw out. I think we do it differently. You, you start a project and then you say, okay, what is it that we need for this project? Do we, can we do it all ourselves or do we need a, an engineer or do we need school teachers or doctors? And then, then, then you go find them, and you may want to find them early on, before you get started to help them, have them help kick the tires to make sure whatever it is that you want to do, in fact, does check out. So due di due diligence and all this stuff is important. Now, if somebody wants ten thousand dollars to, you know, take kids off the street and can't men do, I'm going to worry less about it than. Um, if it's $100 million, to go buy some company. But you've actually uh, tried to uh, scale up many of your things. And what's interesting is you've, you've done scaling at the village level. You've done scaling with your centers right across now the whole University of California system. And you've tried to do scaling at the national level. You're a, a founding member of the president's uh, uh, Global Development, Development Council. Council. Uh, so there are all these different levels where you've kind of worked, and in each one you've tried to sort of, you know, move to scale. Or at least yeah. the next step. Um, yeah. And because often one thing leads to another, and then you look at it, does it make sense? So, yeah, I guess you, you, you do scale up. I mean, a lot of people thought we should never open any more centers at the University of California uh, other than Berkeley. In fact, I think the majority of them didn't think it was a good idea, and I said, well, I'm writing the checks, so I want to do it. And they said, well, oh, okay, and I think now people are pretty glad because of places like University of California to Irvine. You see UC Irvine? Yeah, it's one of our best centers probably next to Berkeley, and who would have known? And the, you also find about the poverty problems, forget about going abroad, I mean, we have enormous poverty problems right in California. We have 230,000 homeless children in, in, in California. Uh, you, you know, the Bay Area is booming. You go across the valley into uh, the Central Valley, and um, you, pictures of how some of the farm workers look, work, and you could swear you're in a third world country. Um, one of our centers is UC Merced. Well, you don't need to, if you're you see Merced, have to go very far to find poverty. Just walk out the door. It's there. Uh, so, um, and, and then you, you, you're surprised that UC Santa Cruz, which is next to, um, you know, near Carmel, and um, there, it, there's a, a large, lot of immigrants around there, um, they're is one county, Paro County, that they tell us that over a half the people living there are undernourished, right under your nose. So, any some, of these, something else to do. Uh, any of these levels strike you as being uh, sort of, you know, place the, the, the level where you can have more impact than any other uh, level. A lot of people from California, for example, think that national government doesn't have many solutions to these kinds of problems. And uh, 
your comment about uh, in uh, Nepal also sort of indicated that uh, national government may not have uh, that much to. Uh, well, you, what's to that, you, who runs your city's program here? Who is it? Bruce Katz. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I He's heard him one, yeah. speak at, um, where was it, NDI, um, and make a very interesting case that at a national level you can't get anything done and where the innovation is taking place is at the cities. And if you really want to go and see where innovation is starting to change things in a material way, you go to Detroit. And I thought his views on all this was, were very interesting. Do you think the same is true I'm, in the poverty, I'm not going in the poverty to, world? I'm not going to Detroit. Not going to Detroit? Okay. Sort no. of like South Sudan? Uh, Detroit's better. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's come back a little bit to, uh, uh, you know, another uh, uh, theme that I think is uh, perhaps common to, uh, you know, your, uh, the adventuring, the mountaineering, the business, and the uh, uh, philanthropy. Uh, and that's the issue of ethics. I mean, it seems uh, pretty clear in the uh, book, in uh, many of the instances uh, that you've uh, described, you've always not thought that ethics is a trade-off or a compromise, either in business or in philanthropy. And uh, I presume that among, there's some honor amongst uh, mountaineers. Uh, well, um, or maybe and, not. And my daughter, Annette, is here. My mother passed away over 20 years ago. She still tells me what to do every day. And it kind of goes back to that in terms of ethics. Do you think it's something that's uh, common in the various worlds that you live in? I, I think it's different in different places. I, I, I also think it's easy to be totally ethical if you're not worried about where your next meal's coming from. Now, if you gotta go steal some something to feed your family, because they're not going to be fed otherwise. Uh, it's easy for us to say, oh, I would never do something like that. I'm not sure. In the uh, uh, book, you, uh, you, you talk really only, I think, uh, once about an episode where uh, you came close to having some uh, real uh, problems. You describe uh, being up. Uh, uh, having a loan where you were uh, leveraged, being called on that, uh, called on that loan, having to scramble to uh, uh, Which get one the was funds that? to uh, uh, come. It was early on in your uh, career. Oh, yeah. What, would, yeah. what would have happened if things went differently, do you think? What would have happened if that, uh, well, if I you hadn't have, been able to escape? Uh, well, I would have had to take a bunch of time to pay off the loan. But uh, no, what it was was a margin call. Um, my grandmother had left me $10,000, and I was a beginning stockbroker and bought all these speculative electronic stocks. And, you know, you would margin them. And then I woke up a year and a half later to find out that my net worth had gone from 10000 to 100000 And then I woke up two months later to find out that it was minus 20000 and um, And then I had a margin call. And see, I, I, I don't trust banks, um, except on long-term loans. Because when banks get into trouble, the, if, if, if you have a loan, they say, don't worry, we're lending you $10,000, and we'll never ask you to repay it and, and, until they do. So I will only, it's just me, borrow on mortgages, because then you pay them so much over a period of 15, 20, 30 years. Uh, but this is a case where if you buy stock on margin, if the value of the equity drops to a certain extent, you have to come up with some money. So this was when I, I wasn't paying any attention to it, and, and the senior partner of the firm said, well, you've got to come up with $10,000 by 11 o'clock. Uh, it was 8 in the morning, and, I, and today you might have, you could have picked any number I got. I don't know where I'm going to get $10,000. So I remembered that the our Heward branch manager had a brother that ran a, a bank, in the, the Mechanics Bank of Richmond, who I knew. So I called him and I said, hey, I need $10,000. I said, can I come talk to you about it? And I said, yeah. So I got into my car. Fortunately, there was less traffic then. And 
you know, uh, 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 pedal to the metal and um, went to Richmond and uh, said, well, look, I own these stocks, but, you know, I'm over leveraged. I need $10,000. The guy starts lecturing me. He says, well, what did you buy him for in the first place? All I said, look, I don't want to lecture. You're going to lend me the $10,000 or not? <laughs> and he said, okay. So I ran back, and it was five minutes to 11 before they were going to sell me out. I put down the $10,000. The stocks rallied over the next week. I sold enough, paid back the loan, and I said I would never, ever do that again, and I never have. And the, the motto, uh, the lesson here is a lot of people, and so I did that at age 25, but you, you find that a lot of people get venturesome later in life, don't really understand the risk reward. And, you know, we certainly saw it in the housing market in 2008 and 2009. You know, people bought houses that they couldn't afford uh, to keep up. Um, and the next thing you know is um, whether it's a margin loan or, or, or was a mortgage loan or whatever it is. So what it, I mean, I just think uh, risk, taking risks is a great teacher. And um, I often say in commencement addresses, you, you just got your degree, now, now, you, now you can begin to learn what it's all about. And understanding how to take risk is something that um, a lot of us do. And so um, people often wonder why I, I take the risks we do. And we take some pretty big ones, but we know pretty well how to calculate them. Doesn't mean we're always right because we're not. But the batting average has been good. But it was a buildup of confidence on how to uh, take care of different situations. I mean, you got to also know if things go, if you say, OK, I'm going to invest in X and we're going to do Y. If things go wrong, and then you say, OK, if things go wrong in advance, let's hope they don't go wrong. What are you going to do about it? That's always an interesting discussion. Okay, well, let me uh, uh, open this conversation up to the uh, uh, audience uh, now. Uh, we'll take a few up, uh, take a few questions, uh, sure. and then Dick, I think uh, you've agreed to uh, stay and uh, sign some books, and sure. uh, hopefully people will buy them. Let me uh, just say that in addition to thinking that you might know about the content of the uh, book, one of the reasons for actually buying it is that there are a, a whole series of really great photos. Uh, that uh, go through pretty much, uh, you know, your uh, life from when you were uh, quite young to uh, uh, to the present, and uh, some of those are uh, uh, really fascinating. And any profits go to the American Himalayan Foundation. Thank you. So, who would like to uh, who'd like to start? I think we've got a couple of roving mics. If you can just uh, say who you are. Uh, so, so my question is about executive compensation and how that plays into uh, development work and nonprofits. So uh, this has been an area that's gotten a lot of criticism. The, the former president of the Boy and Girls Club, I believe, was like caught making over uh, over like a million dollars a year or something like that. And, and people have said that that's a bad model. They, shouldn't, they should be working for significantly less. And then others have said, well, you can't attract good talent um, to manage really large nonprofit organizations. So we're, I mean, based on your experience as someone that has been involved on both philanthropy and in business, um, do you think that it, it makes sense to pay executives that are running uh, larger philanthropic organizations the salaries that you know are, are, are to most standards, pretty large? Strobe's left, uh, Dick, so you can be honest. Uh, oh, Strobe is clearly overpaid, but that's, that's a different issue. No, listen, you, you, you very much get your money's worth with um, all the executives here. Um, look, I can only answer that question hypothetically because we're not involved in any large philanthropic organizations. Um, and I, I worry about all these ones that spend a lot of money advertising, you know, to either save your, you know, uh, dog in the pound or some kids that are, you know, not getting enough to eat, how much of their money actually goes to the projects? And I think, shockingly, you find, uh, a, a, and many of them are very small, 
percentage actually gets down. So it's not just executive compensation. Yeah, and, I, and my attitude is, look, if you're in this world, you shouldn't be in it for the last dollar. I mean, we have the same problem with the University of California. Uh, I could argue that a lot of our faculty are really underpaid. And uh, I mean, to the point that, you know, they can't even afford to send their kids to the school they teach at. Uh, but um, if you want to be in, in the world where you, you need to provide these kind of services, you shouldn't be in it for the last dollar. Uh, so, you know, I can't really comment on whether some big philanthropic organization ought to pay somebody a million dollars or not, depending on how big as it is and what the, the challenge is. But if, you, if that's the main motivation of the executive of a nonprofit, then Maybe you got the wrong guy. Thank you. That was up. I think there was a question right there. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I'm, uh, my name's Carl Polzer, and I'm a policy analyst. Uh, I've been doing a lot of research on the wealth concentration and the growing gap in the U.S. between the haves and the have-nots that you mentioned. And I, I want to bring up a systemic issue of uh, large proportions, and that is. Um, it's often hard for philanthropy to deal with large-scale issues like this. In the United States, about half the population has no retirement savings, and maybe 20 or 30 percent have tens of thousands of dollars, and the average Social Security payment per year is about 14 or 15,000. So you have a need for, this is something the investment community sh you know, might be interested in, establishing like Andrew Carnegie did for the teachers, the TIA CREF, or TIAA, some kind of fiduciary organization that could accept government subsidies and get everybody that's signing up for a social security into a pension, or like a defined contribution plan. So we have everybody owning the country and everybody having, people with, le with lower wealth have to survive so they take less risk. So they need fiduciary help. But I think some national, and I know California has been doing something on the state level. But to me, that would be an issue in, in Australia and Britain are building these systems already. It's not like this is pie in the sky. I just wanted your reaction to that. Thanks. Well, I'm, I think you sort of asked two or three questions, but I, I can tell you in California, because as a, a region of the University of California, I worry about our own retirement system, but I also worry about the state retirement system. and they're all underfunded um, and the obligation is someday that if the money isn't there it's got to come out of the budget now if it ever starts coming out of the budget of the state of California I can't imagine what that's going to do to the services provided by the state but it'll be enormous so um, and wherever you look um, these things are underfunded now if you get a couple of good stock market years in a row. Um, I mean, at one point, uh, back in the you know, 2007, 2008, a lot of these pension funds were in, in pretty good shape. But um, I do actually think we are creating uh, a, a, a growing class of elderly poor. And um, that's a lot of what you see. I'm not sure I got everything you were asking. What, what, what am I missing that? You made a point. Do yeah, you think ahead. there should be a fiduciary uh, organization, uh, Dick, in California? Well, you do have a fiduciary them. organization. I mean, you have boards for uh, CalPERS, Cal uh, STERS, mm -hmm. which is the, the teachers. Um, you, you have them. There are fiduciary organizations there. Um, and the secret is picking people who are good managers. Right, because there's no way, you, you know, um, you can keep up with everything, and, and there is a way of understanding the risk and reward of, in a portfolio. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you can follow up afterwards, or uh, uh, but there are a few others that was. Uh, yeah, there are trustees. Some, some are better than others. Hi, 
Hi, thank you for being here. My name is Melanie Avery, and I work with a nonprofit for homeless veterans and veteran families called Veterans on the Rise. Um, we provide direct services to veterans to get them housed and get them rebalanced. And one of the things that we find is that we are in competition often with wonderful 501c4s that are going after the same funding streams, same funding dollars that we're going after. And wondering what advice you would have for 501c3s that are providing direct services who a lot of times get edged out in terms of funding because of you know the, the balance there between what people want to fund from a policy perspective um, and what they want to fund um, operationally for, for those direct services. I'm not sure I understand enough about what you're talking about to answer the question. I don't know. I'll make a I'm not a U.S. Uh, kind of tax. Uh, I, don't, I, I, I don't know the C4 or, uh, the C4 world. Sam, yeah, do, you I, know, I, do you know about that world? It's not my world. <laughs> Just oh, uh, right the, the, the yeah, that general world. Answer. It, I mean, to me, it's a competition of resources, and do you compete for policy resources, and do you compete for resources to deliver services? Can I sneak in a question? Go ahead. Yeah, please, uh, because I, I I'm unable to answer the last yeah. question. I, I have no clue. Yeah. I get uh, Sam Worthington. Uh, have, how have your passions evolved? You've had a passion for mountaineering. You've had a passion for excellence, for ideas, uh, for building things. Um, how would you look back at your life and career in terms of have these passions influence each other and how have they evolved? I would say nothing much has changed. Um, um, as I said I prefer staying in, um, in you know these lodges rather than tents and I I'm probably at a, a point where I've gone over enough 14,000 foot passes for um, all those years that um, I'm happy to get to a lot of these places by helicopter but I still want to do pretty much the same thing as far as investing is concerned I'm always curious always interested in the next investment but I got a we got a whole bunch of younger folks and I said you go out and kick the tires and let me know what we should do so it, it, it it's kind of like I don't do everything I used to but I'm still have pretty much similar interests yeah right right here in the... no, uh, sorry yeah go go ahead and, and then there's a, there's a lady further up here sure Hi, my name is Umi Howard. Um, I work at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, I do. A pr I have a program that brings together uh, social impact and higher education. And so, I'm curious about um, a, an observation. I wanted to sort of test it with you. One of the things that I feel um, I observe is that the students and the alumni are really driving the social impact agenda within. Uh, graduate school, higher education, kind of the infusion of that um, in our, our university. And I was wondering if the, you see the same thing in the UC system or if things uh, feel like a little different from your perspective. Well, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, the University of Pennsylvania, a lot of your social impact has been on the cities or cities around there. And that's been the focus and that you guys have done very well. Um, I don't think there is a, you know, if I look at Berkeley, um, th there's not that kind of focus. You'll find one group is saying, okay, well, there's, you know, um, uh, kids at risk uh, down in Oakland, and we'll go take care of their schools, or we'll make sure they get fed, or we make, help them get jobs, or we'll help them be safe. But it, it's it's sort of, there isn't, a particularly defined program that's just, you know, one group, um, say, from uh, one school decided to do one thing. A lot of them just don't do much because they, they're tr just trying to get through school. There's a lady right here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Mashid Kavari. I teach at Chernady Washington University, and I was wondering if at your work you deal with the effect of uh, climate refugee, uh, that especially in South and Central, um, in Asia in general, and the effect that it has on development. Thank you. Did you say climate refugees? Climate refugees, yeah. Well, I think a lot of what 
Um, Mary Robinson is doing, um, uh, out of Dublin, used to be president of Ireland, and, and she calls it climate justice. And her point being that the people who are suffering the most for climate change, particularly think, talks a lot about Southern Africa, aren't the ones that caused it. Um, and so that we owe a particular obligation and, 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 and help to those. Um, it seems to me, I don't know, follow it that much, but because of the treaties they've done about um, uh, carbon in, in general, uh, particularly if all, any of you have been in Beijing, Beijing in the last few years, it's when you can't see across the street, you know, you've got a problem. Um, that, you know, the world's trying to get better, but whether it's getting better fast enough, I don't know, but there, there's no question. And I, I don't know really what they're doing, but there is a sense, particularly from people like uh, climate justice and others, that um, uh, it's unfair to have people driven off their lands where they used to uh, uh, raise crops or, or, or animals because the desert took over because of global warming. I don't know if that answers your question, but because I don't know much about it other than it Clearly, a problem. One uh, last question uh, over there. Hi, uh, my name is Ryan. I work in international development. Uh, we help students from sub Saharan Africa get to higher education. And I want to ask you a question that has been bothering me for quite some time. And, um, but in terms of what you've said, you've said that you look for uh, local people on the ground who have the expertise um, that you can trust. You know, you talked about the, the old, I think the king, who said, okay, here's what we need to reinvigorate our town, and you just trusted him, right? No, 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 I said something a little different. Okay. I looked to them for the ideas, not okay. less for the expertise. To re I mean, example, to restore these temples, we brought in a guy, Italian, who had worked on the Sistine Chapel. Hmm. And he has now been going to Mustang for 10, 12 years. And what he did is he took locals and trained them uh, in, um, uh, in, in restoration. No, it's usually the cases that you find there's a problem. You say, okay, there's something we need something to do about. It. And, and, and you have to bring in not only the money but the expertise. Hmm. Okay, so I think that probably answers my question. But so... The, the benefit that a foreigner can bring in terms of philanthropy, uh, you're saying is, is financial and expertise and you rely on locals for ideas. Is that your model? That's a pretty good summary, yes. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you all uh, uh, very much uh, for uh, being here. We've got some uh, uh, sandwiches and our, uh, uh, other food uh, uh, outside, so... Uh, Please uh, uh, have some of that, and uh, Dick will be available to uh, sign any uh, uh, any books that you uh, may have uh, uh, may have uh, bought. And uh, if you haven't yet bought one, uh, there are books, I believe. Meryl, am I right in thinking there are books for sale right there? Yes. Yeah. Great. Or so you can buy you, two. Thank and you very then, much. And then read it twice. And Dick, thank you so much for uh, doing this. That was fun.